very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Steel Mint is back with his annual webinar series. So welcome to Engage 3.0 as we brace for the opening session. The idea is to raise pertinent queries on the present status of the steel and related industries and try to find logical answers to the same over four days from the 1st till the 4th of November 2022. We will be turning the scanner on a host of topics related to steel, iron ore, coal, scrap and recycling and non-ferrous and a lot more. There will be a focus on Europe and decarbonization, of course. Today's keynote session revolves around a highly relevant topic, India's transition to net zero by 2070, the way forward. I am Madhumita Mukherjee, editor Steel Mint. And I am uh, Nishtha Mukherjee, General Manager, Iron Ore and Steel, who will be co-hosting this session. Thank you, Nishtha. Uh, I also thank the Ministry of Steel and the Indian Steel Association for their local support to the webinar. Let me mention that uh, we will take audience queries at the end of the session. So requesting all of you tuned in to send your queries in the chat box and we will take this up in good time. Please mention your name and company when you send us your queries. Thank you. Now, Nishta will make a very short presentation. Over to you, Nishta. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, please allow me a moment to share my screen. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Thank you. India's Vision 2047 document stresses a lot on decarbonization. It also aims at reducing the thermal coal usage in steel making, increasing scrap feed in steel making, and significantly reducing the CO2 emissions. Uh, let's dwell upon the key pointers of Key Vision 2047 document. It aims to increase India's crude steel capacity from current levels of say about 154 million tons to 500 million tons by 2047. And of course, we can see an increase in the uh, EFIF uh, share in India's steel making. Other pointers that the document stresses upon is increasing the scrap feed from current levels of 20% in India's total steel production to about 60% share in India's steel making. It also aims to increase the percentage of high grade steel production to about 50% in India's total steel production. Talking about export, it largely aims to have export share of about 20% in India's total steel production. Last but not the least, it also encourages to increase the per capita usage in steel consumption from the current levels of 77 kgs to about 245 kgs by 2047. So that was a crisp uh, presentation from my end. And over to you, Madhumita ma'am and Neha ma'am for more updates on decarbonization. Thank you, Nishta, for the presentation. Now to come back to the topic, India's transition to net zero by 2070, the way forward. Decarbonization is the way forward if we need to save this planet and at the same time carry on with our industrial activities. And governments across major nations have been girdling up to meet their decarbonization targets. As per the IEA's Iron and Steel Technology Roadmap, the steel industry, predominantly using coking coal as fuel, 85% of which is imported, contributes a little less than 10% of Indian greenhouse gas emissions and accounts for one-fifth of industrial energy consumption. India, of course, has set a target of 2070 for net zero emissions. We are here to learn more about that way forward and what is the government going to do to achieve that vision. And we have a special guest from the government, Mrs. Neha Varma, Director, Ministry of Steel, Government of India, who is just the right person to take us along this journey. Ms. Verma joined the Ministry of Steel Government of India in 2022, where she is posted in the field of energy, environment, sustainability, and climate change, with focus on decarbonization of the steel industry. She has worked in the areas of circular economy, energy efficiency, clean energy transition, green hydrogen, CCUS, etc. She is an Indian Forest Service officer with 17 years of experience in the field of natural resource management, biodiversity, wildlife, sustainability, climate change, and environment prior to joining the Ministry of Steel. Over to you, Ms. Verma. 
Thank you, Madhuvita. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. I hope I'm very clear and uh, audible. So now uh, talking about net zero transition of steel industry 2070, we need to understand the context we are in right now. So uh, as you all know, India is sprinting on a path of unprecedented growth. And India's steel industry, which is one of the leading players of global steel sector, being position number two in capacity and production in the world, holds a key role in writing that growth story. Hundreds of lakhs of crores of infrastructure projects are in pipeline, projected to create an enormous demand of steel by 2030. Not only this, by 2050, when most of the world's demands plateaus, Indian steel market would still be growing and uh, not only growing, it will be thriving. So to keep up with this demand, we have ambitious, uh, ambitious capacity expansion plan, and we plan to double our capacity from 154 million ton of current capacity to 300 million ton by 2030, as has been envisaged in our national steel policy of 2017. But as you all know, there is a flip side to this story as well. Um, this is also a fact that Indian steel sector is the second largest carbon emitting sector of the country with overall contribution to about 12% of carbon emission. And when we look at the world, it is 8%. So keeping our honorable prime minister's 2017 net zero commitment made at Glasgow in Horizon, we are definitely at a critical juncture with the humongous task of decoupling our growth from the carbon emissions. So as is being rightly said all over again, over and over again, that steel industry is a hard to abate sector. And this is so because carbon is very, very intrinsic to the steel making process. The high energy requirement for melting and processing iron ore to iron and then to steel as well as a need of reductant to convert that iron ore to iron makes it so. so. And also, I just want to highlight one another fact that Indian steel sec, uh, industry is a very, very unique industry compared uh, to the other steel sectors of the world. It has a very, very diverse mix of processes, technologies, feedstock, uh, energy sources, and which are distributed across ISPs as well as small players, like we call them secondary steel industries. And we are also very uniquely placed in terms of our resources. Our emission intensity today is at 2.55 tons of CO2 per ton of, uh, car, uh, per ton of uh, steel produced, which is quite high compared to the world average because we have a very low availability of natural gas. We have low availability of scrap and the iron ore, which is used in the country, is again of the low grade. So this puts India in a disadvantageous position. So just because of the availability of the resources, because of the kind of feedstock we are bound to use in our processes, we are at a high carbon emission intensity. And another big challenge is availability of technology. If we talk about here and now, there's a lot of work going on for, uh, for uh, finding out radical solutions of steel making through alternate processes, but the maturity level of any of these technologies is not there for the commercial production. So this puts us in a very tight spot, but, but India is all geared up to achieve our net zero 2070 target, and we are the Ministry of Steel is all set to pull the levers to accelerate this transition to net zero steel and pioneer a model of growth without carbonization. So I would just like to tell you that Ministry of Steel is currently working on a policy which defines the strategy, the roadmap and the action plan for the decarbonization of steel industry while looking at all the aspects of emission abatement ranging from carbon minimization to carbon avoidance to carbon utilization. We are also working on a, a policy architecture which is uh, hinging on five pillars uh, of uh, reducing the use of energy through energy efficiency means, switching over to renewable energy, uh, uh, achieving material efficiency and circular economy, 
uh, we are looking towards process transitions to a cleaner uh, technology usage. And then lastly, uh, we are harping on deep decarbonization efforts using hydrogen and CCUS. And not only on the supply side, Ministry of Steel also has a focus on the demand side drivers and definitely understand the need of creating a market pull for the green steel, for the decarbonized steel. So we, uh, Ministry of Steel is also considering all the possibilities to pump up the demand for green steel in the market. And of course, uh, defining what is green steel, what is net zero steel, what is near zero steel, defining, giving the taxonomy of the steel along with the MRV processes is also under our uh, under process. If we talk about uh, the pathways to uh, this uh, net zero transition by 2070, uh, I would like to say that 2070 is still quite, quite far off and the technology landscape is very nebulous. Right now, it's very difficult to say that what we are going to use in next three years time. Uh, uh, car uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage is in such a nascent stage that's not commercially viable. viable. We have a uh, uh, lot of projects of carbon capture utilization and a lot of plans of CCU uh, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the globe, but uh, India doesn't have a strength on CCU. Right now, we are exploring more of CCS side, but again, we have a long way to go before we are able to bring CCS to a uh, bring down the cost of carbon capture and storage to a level that it can be commercially utilized and can be cost effective for the producers. So, so right now, till 2030, we are focusing on low hanging fruits, which we are sure of, uh, which doesn't depend on a technology which is not yet there. Talking about technology, yes, we have seen a lot of examples of usage of green hydrogen in DRI making uh, as uh, one of the cases in hybrid plant in Sweden. But again, that's on a pilot phase and only by 2026, it's going to be commercialized. So oh, as I said that uh, till 2030, we plan to reduce our carbon emission intensity through energy efficiency, renewable energy, and material efficiency. If we just look in uh, within this sphere, we can easily bring down our emission by 20% by 2030. So there's a lot to do in this sphere itself. And of course, we need uh, to work towards R&D and technology collaborations for deep decarbonization. And uh, we are also looking towards alternate steel making process like molten oxide electrolysis. This is over the horizon, perhaps uh, when this process is commercialized, it gives good result. The whole uh, the whole uh, idea of steel making will change. The kind of feedstock we right now use will change. So definitely there will be a lot of disruptive innovations coming up in future because there is a need to it. We are at a very, very critical juncture. We definitely need to take big steps, leapfrog to a, a, to a, a better position, but we have to also make sure that our industry doesn't suffer because of the drastic measures. So we want to smoothen out the transition. There's no binary switch or a magic bullet or a silver bullet for decarbonization of steel industry. We have to move and follow a path which neither jeopardizes the uh, employment of the people, nor the growth of the uh, country, nor in any way affect the economy of the country. But yes, India is very, very committed to achieve its net zero target by 2070. India is very committed to deliver on this front, circumventing all the challenges which are there on our way. So this is what I have to say about Ministry of Steel. We are ready to uh, take up this pathway. We have already started the process, not only started, we have already moving ahead on this using energy efficiency techniques uh, in our steel plants, at least for the ISPs, for the integrated steel plants, we have drastically reduced uh, emission intensity from uh, in last five years. So, uh, and the scheme of, as you would know, the PAT scheme, uh, perform, achieve and create scheme had really helped us move forward in that direction. Similarly, renewable energy is a low hanging fruit. We hope 
that while India uh, uh, tries to achieve its tar set target of 500 gigawatt renewable energy by 2030, Indian steel industry would be able to meet all its electricity re requirement through renewable energy. And we also uh, uh, clearly know that uh, using a low grade iron ore uh, increases the coke consumption, hence uh, leads to higher decarbon uh, higher carbon emission rate. So uh, we foresee a time within few years when there will be more and more usage of pellets in the iron and steel making and thus reducing carbon emission. And also uh, scrap, we are trying to see the possibility of increasing more and more of scrap. World over the emissions are low because of the scrap and usage of natural gas, uh, but we can only go so far with the usage of scrap and natural gas will always be a difficult choice for us because of its low availability. Uh, so this is all what I have to say that uh, we are all set to pull the levers for decarbonization. Yes, there are challenges, but we will definitely meet on it. Zero 2070 goals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Verma. Thank you for that very illuminating talk. Yes, 2070 is way ahead, but if we can achieve the milestones by 2030, it would make the journey so much easier. Thank you again. Now, so we have some questions from our side. Uh, uh, one question is, with the uh, blast furnace steel making infrastructure set to expand to meet rising demand and the need for scale, how is the government planning to set up CCUS in India? As the cost factor is high, what are the options available that can be tapped? So as I said, CCUS right now is in a nascent stage. We have some like, examples within our country where CCS is being attempted. Even in the steel industry, Tata's have set up a CCS pilot plant at Jamshedpur. But uh, uh, again, the commercial viability of such projects is in question. But I would say this is only in the current scenario, the current realm of things. It's going to change because there is an extreme focus on research on CCUS worldwide, not only in, in not only just in India. So right now, Ministry of Steel's focus is to foster the environment of R&D. And right now, I would also like to tell you that we not only talk, want to talk about R&D, that's research and development, we want to take it to a one step further and want to talk about our d, &D. So our idea is that uh, through this policy document, we want to create institutions which can take up the research from the lab to the pilot levels. And by 2030, this is what our uh, idea is that we would be able to set up pilots and perhaps on meeting the success, we would be able to commercialize some of them. So, but I cannot say anything for sure right now. So that's why I said that we are um, setting up milestones and targets for our near, near future with the available technologies and available uh, feedstock. For 2030 and beyond, we think technology and R&D is going to play a very, very important role. And that's why we want to set up an institutional framework, a governance framework, which can foster that kind of environment and set up an enabling ecosystem for that. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, before moving on to the next question, I would uh, request the online attendees who want to ask their questions to drop in their questions in the chat box and do mention your name as well as company name. Uh, Ma'am, the next question uh, that uh, I would request you to share your views upon is, what is the government's plan as regards boosting the hydrogen electrolyzer capacity uh, in India? Um. MNRE, Ministry of uh, Natural Resources, uh, Renewable Resources and Energy are already working on, uh, you must be aware, on a draft mission on green hydrogen. And uh, in that uh, draft mission, they have already outlined how to increase the capacity of electrolyzers through PLI schemes and other policy incentives. So yes, MNRE is working on it and uh, we would be keenly looking forward uh, to how we can use this enhanced electrolyzer capacity, enhanced production of green hydrogen for usage in steel industry. Thank you. 
Uh, Ma'am, I have another question. Uh, how can the supply of affordable natural gas be ensured for the domestic DRI sector at a time when inflation is going sky high? As I just mentioned, uh, India is uh, on a disadvantageous position because of low availability uh, and high cost of natural gas. So, uh, um, as a strategy to decarbonization, we are not harping on natural gas because, uh, yes, uh, because uh, uh, that's uh, that's not something which is under our control. So we are looking for alternative methods, alternative pathways for decarbonization right now in a given current scenario. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, given the ministry's endorsement of uh, coal gasification, uh, the question arises as to how effective is gasification since a supplementary carbon capture or a sequestration method? What's your take on this? So as I just said that natural gas is not available, but we want to switch from a solid fuel based, based DRI to a gas based DRI. Ultimate aim is to have pure green hydrogen-based DRI as is being projected uh, and, um, through a hybrid plant. But to go there, we have to find some interim pathways because we are not yet ready to, uh, uh, with the technology to use green hydrogen, pure green hydrogen, 100% green hydrogen in steel making. So, uh, and we, but we are today ready to blend some percentage of hydrogen into our steel making. But so we want to shift from coal-based DRI to gas-based DRI and coal gasification perhaps can provide a smoother transition along with CCS. Of course, coal gasification without CCS is uh, even more uh, carbon emitting. So that is not something we are looking forward to. But yes, it could provide a smoother transition uh, to uh, from coal-based DRI to gas-based DRI. Uh, Ma'am, you did speak about uh, hydrogen and uh, about its blending aspects, but I want to ask you, can hydrogen uh, be a standalone fuel solution as well? Or will it always be a complementary to alternate fuels? And what are the constraints in using hydrogen in steel making? Yeah. So, uh, you need to understand, first understand that in India, we make steel through two processes, mainly two processes, blast furnace, BOF fruit, BF, BOF fruit, and then DRI, EF fruit. So in blast, and 45% of our steel is made through blast furnace fruit. In blast furnace fruit, we can blend green hydrogen, the hydrogen with PCI only to a very limited extent. So we can use green hydrogen. We are ready with that right now also, but only to a very, very limited extent. So it can help us reduce carbon emission only by like maximum of 10% or so, not, not beyond that. But in gas-based DRA process, 100% usage of uh, high green hydrogen is still under, uh, uh, under experimentation phase, as I just mentioned. But we can definitely blend green hydrogen with natural gas uh, given we have availability of natural gas or usage of coal gasification, again, we can use green hydrogen, blend green hydrogen. So the problem with green hydrogen right now is it is uh, the storage, the transportation, the whole ecosystem behind using the green hydrogen. So India has to move a little forward before we create that kind of a system and develop a cluster approach of production of green hydrogen, distribution, storage, and transportation, as well as when we bring down the cost of green hydrogen, then definitely we can start blending green hydrogen in our steel making process. But usage of 100% uh, of hydrogen right now is not feasible. Problem with usage of green hydrogen or any hydrogen in steel making as a reductant is that it is an endothermic, it creates an endothermic reaction which means that you need more higher temperature to melt the iron. It, it reduces the temperature of the reactor. So we need to give some, provide some extra energy sources. So that is what is being right now experimented with. 
So, but in future, I'm sure this is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ma'am, uh, next question is that how complex is it becoming for India for adopting requisite policies as we shift from merely reducing the greenhouse gases to achieving net zero emissions? Is the steel industry moving in tandem? Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, as I just said that India's steel industry is one of the leading in industry in the world and our big players have a global footprint like Tata, JSW, AMNS, and everyone is aware of kind of uh, what we are facing today. Everyone is very sensitive about the uh, carbon emission of the steel industry, and we are in constant consultation with our industry people while we are formulating our policy, and they are supporting us in every move, and we are supporting them to move forward. So, what is being done in the Ministry of Steel is in tandem with the aspirations of steel industry, with the aspirations of economic growth of the country, while taking along the steel industry with us and also ensuring just transition that no one is left behind. And we want to ensure the employment opportunities for everyone by skilling and reskilling. So that's also in our focus. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Do you have any more questions? Oh, I think uh, maybe we can start taking up the questions from the audience. Yeah, uh, there's a question from Nirmalo Dev from Steel Mint. He wants to know, will India's carbon trading market be set up by 2023? How constructive a role can emissions trading scheme play in India's decarbonization effort? So, uh, you know, we definitely need to create the market for the steel and we de definitely need to uh, market for the green steel, the low emission steel. And we also need to set up mechanism for uh, incentivizing the industry to produce uh, green steel. But uh, carbon trading is not only the mechanism. There are other options we are currently exploring. But yes, this is one of the uh, pathways which can be taken up. This is one of the policies which MOEFCC might be working on. So that is the sphere of MOEFCC and uh, uh, let's hope whatever is done and the policy landscape in India will be definitely very conducive for the decarbonization of steel industry. Um, and we have a question on the demand capacity balance outlook. What is the demand uh, steel demand capacity balance outlook is going to be like by 2030-35. This question has been asked by a gentleman called Sashi from Uttam Value Steel. Would you like to take this question? Yeah. So, Madhumita, because I have to leave for a meeting, this is the last question I'll sure, take. Sure. And, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, by 2030, we are planning to double the capacity of the steel industry one, from 154 to 300 million ton. And currently, we are on the track. Our um, big players, the ISPs, have already set up their plan for capacity expansion. You have recently heard how... AMNS uh, has uh, uh, is uh, increasing its capacity in Gujarat, so that is we we are going to see lot of uh, capacity uh, increase, and also definitely uh, demand will also increase. As I said, um, this year itself we are seeing a higher demand compared to the last year because of the infrastructure growth of India. And there are a lot of projects in pipeline, especially Gati Shakti, uh, um, the PM Avas, Yojana. There are a lot of other projects which are creating this kind of a demand. So uh, we are right on track and we definitely uh, see that there is a de demand capacity balance by 2030 and uh, everything seems to be in place. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh... Ma'am has to go. We don't have time to take any more questions. And if anyone from the audience has any queries, we will get those uh, answered separately. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving us your valuable time. And I hope the audience enjoyed the webinar session on India's transition to net zero by 2070, the way forward. And it was an informative session. And uh, I, I hope the audience enjoyed it as much as we did hosting it. A big thank you to the Ministry of Steel and the Indian Steel Association for their logo support to the webinar. 
Uh, before we end this session, a reminder to our viewers to join in for the next webinar on how will India steel demand pan out in the short to medium term. It starts right after the end of the current session. Okay. Thank you so much, Padmaneta and Nisha. Thank you. Thanks, Sam.